Cranky Geek Fall 2022 is brought to you by Google, Spearline, Crisp, and Daily. For more information, see the links in the description. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're back with the Google update. All right. Um, yeah, so my name is Huib Kleinout. I'm a product manager at Google, and I'm here with the rest of the team to talk a bit about what Google has been working on in WebRTC in the past year. So as mentioned at the start of this event, WebRTC remains very strong, and we see that too in the Chrome browser. We're seeing like a billion minutes, uh, video minutes every day in the Chrome browser. And so we remain strongly invested in, in WebRTC in, in the browser. Um, as applications got more complex, more videos at the same time, more pr processing and effects, we needed to work on performance. Um, my colleague Marcus Handel will talk a bit more about what exactly we did there. We also continue to invest in media quality. In particular, in the past year, we worked on echo cancellation. We're seeing a great uptake of new codecs, AV1, a new uh, codec on, uh, around, the, around the corner also, um, Lyra V2. And as most, uh, in most cases, when people communicate online, they share content. And my colleague Elat will talk a bit about uh, what new APIs for sharing screen content to be uh, introduced. We continue to work on the fundamentals. So like APIs got faster, we shipped a complete new data channel implementation and extended WebRTC APIs further to allow new use cases and experiences. If we take a look at what we did with audio, uh, we worked a lot on all, uh, echo cancellation, and that's basically in nearly all video calls, there's some form of audio flowing. And if you capture audio with the microphone, you need to cancel what is being played out. We improved it so that even like small blurbs of echo will be canceled and that you'll have a cleaner signal from the microphone. Um, you can also capture audio from, from other sources, like from a browser tab, for instance. And then in those cases, you also want all the, everything that's being played out being canceled. We introduced a new browser-wide echo canceller, um, which means that if you play YouTube during a video call, that nobody but you can hear the music from that YouTube tab. In 2023, next year, we want to further increase the capabilities. We wanted to make it possible to capture windows or the entire screen and capture the audio there and also being able to cancel it. So you can have like full flexibility in the way that you want to use uh, audio in the browser. We saw with um, AV1 is gaining steam. Uh, we landed a new decoder in Chrome, which is a lot faster, and we're tuning, uh, tuning AV1 to be uh, roughly at VP9 level complexity, which means that you will save bits and have uh, with the same quality and same complexity as you will have with VP9. Also, the first support of har har AV1 hardware encode has been landed, and like if you have the right graphics cards, you you will have like very low power um, usage of AV1. Um, yesterday, we, I heard an announcement that Qualcomm shipped their first mobile chipset with AV1 encode, so it's really getting there. The Google research team, they introduced Lyra V2, which is an end-to-end uh, -end neural audio codec. It it's, has really great real-time properties, so it has very low latency and very good quality, audio quality at just a few kilobits per second. It's really at a state where it's also ready for experimentation, and we hope to see this like being uh, ultimately landing in WebRTC. Um, yeah, after that, we'll starting with uh, Elot, my colleague Elot will take over and talk a bit about what we've done on the screen share. So I'm Elad and I'm here to talk about screen sharing. So first I'm going to give a brief introduction, then I'm going to speak about privacy and how to maximize it, and then I'm going to speak about a couple of new APIs that we've introduced over the past year. So first, some background. Get Display Media is an API that allows you to capture a tab, a window, or a screen. It's been implemented by all major browsers, and with each particular browser, you get a different type of uh, media picker that allows you to, as the user, um, to decide what you want to share. In the case of Chrome, it looks roughly like this. And once you actually start capturing, you can do anything you would like with this video. You can store it locally to a file, you can store it remotely, or you can even transmit it, uh, transmit it in real time to a video call such as this one. Now, when you're transmitting it uh, in, in real time, 
there are obvious uh, issues here. Namely, if you make any mistake, you cannot go back and fix that. And one common mistake is to share things that you do not actually intend to share. For example, exposing other tabs, other uh, web applications, bookmarks, browsing history, or notifications that come up. So for that reason, we think that it's best if you share a tab. And that's why we are trying to start and nudge users towards sharing a tab by reordering the picker so that it shows tabs first. And we're rolling that out subject to an experiment. And so far, the results are very promising. But we're not stopping here. We're also trying to make tab sharing even better so that users would be more likely to, ch uh, to choose that. So we're trying to do that in three different ways. First, we're making customization better. Second, we're uh, making uh, integration better. And third, we're making embedding even better. So let's start with customization. So we've introduced a couple of new controls, uh, and I'm only going to go over two of these, but you're welcome to look the other ones up online, for example, on developer.chrome.com. So the first one is self-browser service. If you're in a video call, you're very unlikely to want to actually share the video call directly with the other participants of that call. When that happens, you get the Hall of Mirrors effect, where you share yourself, sharing yourself, sharing yourself. And especially if you're also sharing audio, the result is very, very disruptive. So for those applications that don't actually want the user to share the current tab, they can now specify self-browser surface exclude, and that option will just not be offered to the user, and they would not be able to shoot themselves in the foot anymore. Second, we've got the surface switching uh, control. If you specify surface switching include, Chrome shows a share this tab instead button on all tabs other than the one you're sharing, which allows the user to quickly change to sharing a different tab. Now, this is useful because one of the main reasons for users sharing the entire screen is that they wish to uh, share more than one thing and switch between things without interacting with the capturing application each time. So if you've got this button, that perverse incentive is diminished. Next, we've introduced a couple of new APIs for better integration between capturing and captured applications. So it's always possible for applications to communicate using existing mechanisms such as broadcast channel, shared worker, shared uh, cloud infrastructure. But the problem is that although the capturing application gets every single pixel from the captured application, it does not actually get any metadata. So it does not know what the origin of the captured application is, or if there is a session ID, it does not know that. So capture handle is here to bridge that gap by allowing a captured application to expose metadata, such as the origin, session ID, and anything else it wishes to expose. And the way that we use that in Google is that if Meet captures slides, it now exposes user-facing controls for previous slide, next slide, start playing video, stop playing video, et cetera. And all of those are, once you press that, it, trans it gets transmitted over a shared worker to the captured uh, meet session. Now, we're also working on making that API even better with additional enhancements. Uh, to name one, we're working on also adding a message port so that it would always be possible and easy to communicate directly. And you wouldn't have to go over something like a broadcast channel, which could get interrupted by a storage partitioning. Next, we're working on, uh, we've uh, introduced conditional focus. So every time you start capturing a tab or window, the browser is faced with the question, should it focus that tab or window, or should it retain focus in the capturing application? And the answer depends on the nature of your capturing application, as well as what the user ends up choosing. So if we look at Meet, for example, if the user ends up choosing a slides uh, presentation, we don't actually want to uh, focus that presentation because we can control it remotely. But if the user chooses anything else, then we assume that the user wants to start interacting with that content, and therefore we immediately focus that content. And conditional focus lets you do that. It lets you make the decision immediately after the user makes their choice. Now, to give just one more example of an application that can benefit from this, I often use Tela, which is an, an application for recording yourself giving presentations. But when using, to, when using this tool, if you start sharing, 
you don't actually start recording just yet. You need to go back to that application, press start, and then there is a countdown until you actually start recording. And the way that Tela handled this before was that they would change their title to come back in order to beckon the user back to the application. But with conditional focus, this is no longer necessary. They can now just instruct the browser to not switch focus. Last, we want to make embedding a video, uh, a video conferencing tool even better. So embedding a video conferencing tool inside of your application was always possible. You just had to, had to embed an iframe and it worked. But there was one uh, shortcoming, and that was that you could not actually share that very tool directly to the same call without transmitting remote participants' videos back to them. You could, uh, you could crop, but cropping using JavaScript was uh, not very simple, not very efficient, and not very robust. Because if the user resized the window or scrolled or changed zoom, you would have to change coordinates, and that could potentially involve some cross-process um, cross communication. So you would end up with a couple of miscropped frames. So we introduced a, an API called Region Capture, whereby you choose one element in the page, you tag that, and you always end up cropping to wherever that element ends up being, uh, being drawn on every single frame, which makes everything a lot easier for you and much more robust. Now, we're not stopping here for element capture. I'm sorry. So uh, region capture is really useful, but uh, it suffers from one short uh, short, yeah, shortcoming. And that is that if anything ends up drawing on top of your target element, those pixels also end up getting captured. And sometimes that's appropriate, but sometimes less so. So now we're working on yet another API that's going to let you take a specific element and then only the subtree of the DOM that starts with that element is going to get captured, and anything that ends up being uh, ends up drawing on top is going to be magically erased. So in the example here, if we've got this, um, if we've got this video, any controls and the progress bar or preview that ends up drawing on top would not be captured, which is very useful. So hopefully, I can talk to that uh, to you more about that next year uh, as we keep on working on that. And with that. I hand it over to Marcus. <clears throat> I'm Marcus Sandell, uh, and I'm an engineer on the Google Meet video performance team. Uh, so I'm here to talk about projects and plans related to performance that have been undertaken during 2022 and our plans going forward. Uh, a year ago, Hope had a great slide telling you about all the great performance work uh, that went down during 2021, and we're continuing this uh, tradition this year. Uh, so the performance focus stays, and we're continuing to invest heavily in RTC performance uh, with the goal of making the WebRTC experience free of fan noise and thermal throttling. And uh, we're collaborating with other companies like Intel, Apple, AMD, and Microsoft on the performance topic. So for 2022, we continue the strategy from 2021 with enabling zero-copy media transfer anywhere we can. Uh, there are many projects on the way to ensure core media types can reach encoders and effects processing while media is still residing in GPU memory, so you can avoid large copies. Um, we've also done things that will indirectly help performance. The WebRTC Media Capabilities API uh, was launched this spring, and this API is important to enable apps to query power efficiency support for individual codec types. Uh, and also carry support for querying scalability modes, which is important to RTC. And to go with that, Intel is adding VP9 and AV1 hardware encoding support uh, to Chromium for Windows. So we should be up for interesting combos going forward. And a lot of focus has been on how we execute things. Uh, this group of projects focuses on enabling GPU and CPU uh, work to execute concurrently and also to make us wake up less frequently. And this is a theme of projects like the metronome and the sync decoding projects. And uh, also one notable thing here is that the, the pacer improvements, they actually started out to impact wake up frequency, but eventually ended up with latency uh, the most uh, for your pleasure. And last but not least, we're uh, collaborating with Intel on making Chromium execute efficiently in the presence of newly emerging hybrid core computing architectures, and uh, also on reducing network IPC inside Chromium. So 
here is a picture of the basic simplified organization of the RTC pipeline. Uh, it explains the basic components involved in transferring yourselves uh, from webcam to remote screen. And I wanted to point out where in the pipeline uh, the projects impact. Uh, serial copy capture on Windows, that can save up to 10% total CPU in conjunction with effects. Uh, the capture produces textures, which is great for client effects and hardware encode. Serial copy type capture is the same, but it's for tabs, obviously, uh, and it's been showing 10% of the CPU savings in the lab. Um, optimized static tab capture enables WebRTC to survive on static content capture, uh, and meaning that no frames are flowing from the capture in case uh, content is static. And that wasn't previously possible inside WebRTC because of dependencies on frames always flowing. Uh, and it's measured uh, to save up to 20% per CPU uh, <clears throat> of a CPU, sorry, uh, in the lab under favorable conditions, and it's under experimentation. The remaining projects in the diagram impact when and how we execute things. Uh, so the metronome, it aligns all non-critical timer activity to 64 hertz. And the sync decoding projects align decodes to happen on trigger. And it's most impactful on very high time count meetings. Uh, I wanted to double click a little on why we care about how we execute things. And uh, this slide shows a diagram, uh, which can be found in Intel's en energy effic efficient platforms. And it shows platform power usage as a function of execution frequency and duration. And what it really says here is like, don't run too long. And when you do run things, don't run it too often. Um, <clears throat> When we set up to measure where we were in terms of the frequency of invocation in Chrome, we found out that RTC was in a not so flattering area in this graph. Uh, so some careful profiling of what invokes Chrome led to the introduction of the metronome and sync decoding projects that I mentioned earlier. I also have another illustration of what they accomplished visually on the next slide. So this is a before and after state of a muted meet seven by seven call as it would have looked in 2021 against a metronome call with all bells and whistles. Uh, it, the, these are uh, perfetto traces and show, and they both show about uh, 100 milliseconds of activity from a subset of Chrome threads during the call. Uh, and the recurrent activity at the top, uh, that's uh, indirect processing from vSyncs. So the takeaway is, is that in the last year lane, you see almost everywhere, it, there is activity everywhere, all the time. It's like an ant's nest. And in the metronome lane, it looks much more clean and less like a shotgun target. Uh, and in the metronome case, it gives processors much more opportunity to enter sleep states and save some power. But really, the message I wanted to bring to you with these slides is that Google is working really hard on bringing truly power efficient RTC into your labs. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Harald, which will tell you about web APIs. Thank you very much. I'm Harald. I'm a software engineer with Google. I've been working with WebRTC since roughly forever. So new APIs we're developing, some of them have released, some of them will release. Uh, when you want to build an application that goes across multiple tabs, one of the things you do is to capture something, camera, presentation, whatever. We start out with uh, uh, tab captures. And then the other part of your application that runs, runs in another tab, another window, wants it. You could send it, but no, we have an alternative. You could just move it. So that's a, that's a building block for building applications. And it turned out to be complicated, but uh, we're getting there, and we're going to make it more general as the year go by. Media Cap built this API is one of the ways that gives people more information to make their products conferencing better by knowing what they're running on, what the capabilities are in a privacy-preserving fashion. So. This is a unified API across WebRTC and Web Codex. It's been out since April. And uh, I do recommend using that API if you want to know what your hardware is capable of. 
scalable video codecs. We've been doing variants of this for years, and we've been having problems controlling exactly what's sent for years. The new APIs, which are based on work that was done in a con conjunction with the AV1 codec development called uh, the SAC API, that's useful for sending out, instead of separate streams in this size and that size and that size, you just send out one stream and the recipient or the SFU can extract exactly the frame size that is best for the people who are watching your content. And speaking of control, we also have the RTP head, head extension control API. This is access to features that are not turned up on, the, on by default or turning off features that you really don't need in your environment. This is something you shouldn't do blindly, but uh, if you're already doing it by STP manipulation, you'll be looking forward to stopping doing that and having a structured way to do it. But we're not stopping with the stuff that is currently in the pipeline. There's more coming in. We have experiments running and are trying to figure out the best approaches to do ICE negotiation control so that if you're connected via wired, wireless, Wi-Fi, telephone, whatever, you should remain connected and you should use the best way of connecting always. And the browser is doing a fairly good job of that. But sometimes there are ways where you can improve and do better. So you want to push more of that control up towards where the applications can get at it. And of course, when you're transferring media, you got great opportunities for processing the raw media with the breakout box APIs or Canvas for those who prefer that one. And uh, but the, the amount of things you can do with encoded media is limited so far. So you want to have the same universal pluggability you have in other places so that whether a stream of encoded data comes in from a camera, comes in from a connection, comes in from a file, or you want to send it to a screen or to a file or to a decoder or to someone else, that should be entirely up to the application to decide which one they choose to do. So we have been lining up the use cases and trying out things so that we can figure out what's the best way to do this. We are very far from locking down APIs yet. And uh, since we haven't locked them down, we also have a good bit from implementing them. We're experimenting and we're finding that this is the direction we want to go in. So watch out for this next year. And with that, I will just say thank you for listening. And uh, it's been a pleasure to talk about new developments in Chrome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our sponsors, Google and WeberC.org, supporting web real-time communications. Spearline. Guarantee a better customer experience by testing, monitoring, and benchmarking your voice and video communications. CRISP. CRISP's AI solution removes background noise and echo from meetings. Daily. Build communications into any application.